You are watching NCN. Good afternoon. Uh, joining us here at NCN, DPI, Department of Public Information, um, is uh, the Attorney General of Guyana, uh, Mr. Anil Nandalal. And thank you very much for coming in uh, to speak to us this afternoon. We are live on different platforms and to our viewers, I'm, I'm honored to, to be interviewing you. Well, I wanted to sort of, first of all, ask you this question bluntly and for your assessment. What is the relationship between the government of Guyana and ExxonMobil? The relation, well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to this interview. And it's a pleasure to be here. And it's always a privilege to be afforded an opportunity to speak to the people of Guyana. What is the relationship between the government of Guyana and Exxon? The relationship between the government and Exxon is the relationship that would exist between any foreign investor and a government. It's governed by a contract. It's governed by licenses. It's governed by permits. And it's governed by the laws of Guyana. Uh -huh. I can assure you that is a relationship that is arm's length and it's a relationship that the government uh, uses to ensure having regard to the given parameters that the people of Guyana get a good deal from the oil and gas sector mm -hmm. uh, or the best possible deal having regard to the current realities. The, the public perception that is out there, an allegation that I've heard time and again, is that ExxonMobil has come to Guyana and is robbing the bank, bank dry, is stripping everything from, the, from our economy, robbing the people of Guyana blind. Uh, it's gone to the bank, it's raided the bank, it's basically running the country. And we're just, we're just, our government is just an enabler of ExxonMobil. There is a lot of hysteria there is a lot of misinformation, there is a lot of misconception, and there is a lot of misunderstanding permeating in the form of an avalanche in relation to the oil and gas sector, in relation to ExxonMobil, in relation to the relationship between the government and Exxon. And I hope that I will use this opportunity again as I have done in so many, on so many occasions, to dispel those misinformation and misconceptions. So ExxonMobil came here to explore for oil and gas when it was not determined that oil and gas existed in commercial quantities. Many other companies would have embarked upon similar endeavors, and they failed. There was an existing regime in place when Exxon came, and that regime was extended to Exxon. Mm -hmm. Exxon entered the arena in accordance with those given parameters. And then Exxon found oil in commercial quantities. That happened when we were out of, we were in government when the find was made. But by the time the operational contract and profit sharing agreement was negotiated and entered into, we were out of government by virtue of the 2015 general and regional elections. Now, it is one thing to have a particular 
framework and particular parameters when one is exploring because one is doing so at one's own risks and it costs billions of dollars to explore. So obviously the framework would have been different because here you have the investor or the explorer coming at his own expense. All the capital outlays are theirs. All the risks are theirs. And all the expenditures are theirs. This is billions of dollars. But, and and in, this, in this is cars. not yeah. a thousand dollar industry or a million dollar industry. This is a multi billion dollar industry. So it is a capital, heavy, heavy, heavy capital outlay you're speaking about. Yeah. Now, when oil is. Now, so obviously the investor would want certain guarantees. And the, any intelligent and prudent investor would want some degree of security that if I find oil, then there are certain guarantees that will be extended to me. Right. Right? Uh, uh, yeah. and, and, and that, that is a form of enticement. Mm -hmm. And that's proper and acceptable any part of the world. Mm -hmm. That's the exploratory stage. When you find the thing that you're exploring for, the matrix changes significantly. And that is where a prudent government now ought to be sitting at a table having regard to the already existing contractual obligations and frameworks that we have agreed to already. We know that. Mm -hmm. The prudent investor would be negotiating as far as possible to get what was assured of them and to possibly increase it. Yes. The best deal. The best deal. Yeah. And, and nobody has to apologize for that. Companies like Exxon are there to make a profit. Mm -hmm. They are profit driven. And if they can get the best possible deal, there's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. There's nothing immoral about that. There's nothing, certainly nothing illegal about that. A government's duty, on the other hand, is to ensure that the government gets the best deal also out of the given situation for the benefit of the people. people of so it is against that backdrop that the two parties go to the negotiation table to work out now the production agreement and the consequential profit sharing arrangement that will be derived therefrom. Right. Which brings us to what, 2016? That brings us to the 2016 in contract. Contract. Okay. You're not in government. We are not in government. And the previous government, APNU FC, made that contract, that they, agreement. They entered into that contract. So Firstly, you, yes. as far as we know, not as far as we know, it's public knowledge that the, now ExxonMobil is in this business for about a hundred years or more. Yes. They have a battery of lawyers numbering hundreds, if not thousands. They would have confronted every conceivable commercial issue, technical issue, environmental issue, environmental issue political issue, social issue, mm -hmm. that can possibly arise in this type of arrangement. They would have done it. Mm -hmm. They would have confronted it. So you have a hundred years of that type of experience. Coupled with, it's one of the largest company, one of the richest companies in the world, so it has the best human resource base mm -hmm. at the technical level in every respect. Legally, as I said, they would have had a, they have a battery of lawyers numbering hundreds if not thousands. So you have that track record right. and that type of company you're dealing with. A prudent government would have ensured 
that if not a negotiation team of the same or similar experience and qualifications, at least you would have a negotiation team of qualified persons with the requisite experience in this field. Mm -hmm. A field that is brand new to Guyana, right. an area of law that is brand new to Guyana, a type of contract never seen before in Guyana. What did the APNU AFC did? They gave the subject minister, it would appear, a loan to negotiate and sign this contract. We are told that the contract was prepared, handed, approved at cabinet, uh -huh. and signed by the minister. Wow. We don't have on record, and no one has ever placed on the record any export advice, any export service sought or offered. But you were in the opposition at that time. Did it ever come up in Parliament? No. <laughs> I'm going to get to that. Okay. Not only did they sign the contract, they hid it from the Guyanese people. Hmm. We were not even told in the Parliament that they are negotiating this contract. No public consultations were held. No consultations of any kind mm -hmm. were held. The parliament was not informed. The opposition was not, informed. was not informed. The people of Guyana were kept in the dark. This contract was signed. And a year after, it was made public. It was made public after information was leaked. Mm -hmm. And we went to the registry where it was filed and required to be filed as of law, and we discovered the contract. Worse yet, when we discovered the contract, then we realized, and I walked with a couple pages of the contract. Okay. We realized that clause 33 of the contract provides for a signature bonus. It reads thus. The contractor shall pay to the government a signature bonus of 18 million US dollars. Such payment will be made within a period of 15 business days after the effective date of the contract. So 15 days after they signed this contract in 2016, they received an 18 million U.S. dollar yes. bonus. Hmm. Now, the Constitution of Guyana says that all monies received by and on behalf of Guyana must be deposited in the Consolidated Fund mm -hmm. and can only be withdrawn from the Consolidated Fund through a parliamentary process which must scrutinize it and must approve the purpose for which it is going to be spent. That's not ordinary law saying that. Mm. That's the Constitution of Guyana. Right. This money was never deposited in the Consolidated Fund. It was never reported to the Parliament. I'm not finished. Mm. When we discovered the contract and we saw the signing bonus provision, which they would have received a year before. We asked the Minister of Finance, where is this money? He first said, I am unaware of any such money and any such signing bonus. Mm -hmm. I have never received, and the government of Guyana has never received such a money. We then went and we produced a letter signed by the very minister, the finance minister, who just told the nation that he is unaware of this money. We discovered a letter signed by him to the governor of the Central Bank of Guyana directing the opening of an account 
to deposit this money. Well, this song's like fraud. I mean, this song's... It, it is. It is a violation of the Constitution mm -hmm. because it's supposed to go in the consolidated fund. Right. Not no account in the central bank. Also, once it goes into the consolidated fund, it now has to become part of the accounting record of the country. You had two or three years budget after this money was deposited. And it never showed up. It never showed up in any of the budgets, in any of the accounting record of the country. Wow. So the Auditor General never knew uh -huh. that that money is there. So, let, permit me to continue. Yeah. Was it ever found? <laughs> I mean, it's a question. So, then he was, when he was confronted with his own signature on a document, mm -hmm. then he said, oh, yes, we received it, but I thought it was a donation. Huh. Can you believe that? A donation. $18 million. A donation to who? Apparently to his political party. Now, that is an admission that they are prepared to accept a bribe. Because if you give by international standards, if you sign a contract of this magnitude mm. and you accept a signing bonus, which you think is a gift to your political party, that is corruption by any standard, yeah. any part of the world. Yeah. So here is the Minister of Finance confessing to the world that his government had received 18 million US for the political party. Mm -hmm. Tell me if that is not corruption that and bribe. Is, that is uh, the reliction of so, the city, yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So that is what you had. So not only did you have a secret contract being secretly negotiated without any export advice and guidance, you had the receipt of a signing bonus that was also kept secret. Right. And then you had the entire contract itself being hid, hidden from the Guyanese people for one or more years, until one and a half years or two years before we made it public. Okay, so you're so yeah, that on. is what you have to understand. We can go into the terms of the con contract yeah. a little later, but I just want to outline for the people out there the circumstances, the background, and the nefarious environment in which this contract was negotiated, right executed and the, 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 the way it was hidden mm -hmm. from public scrutiny. So you have been in government for four years. Why not scrap this deal? Very good question. Why not scrap this deal? Any part of the world invest, first of all, let us accept that Countries like Guyana need private investment, both national and foreign. Mm -hmm. right? That's a given. We have always said that. Jenny Jagan, who was an avowed Marxist, accepted when he got into government that the private sector must be the engine of growth mm -hmm. of his government and economy. Right. So let's start from that perspective. For example, as you would know, and the people out there would know, that oil, though discovered now, would have been there for centuries. Yes. That's not a, that oil didn't go there last year and, or 2015. It was there for centuries. Mm -hmm. We never had the capability and capacity to exploit it. Who is exploiting it now? Mm -hmm foreign investments, all right? I, I can't point to a country anywhere in the world that has been built without foreign investments, none. Mm -hmm. So that's a given, you need foreign investments. What are the things that a foreign investor looks for when he's looking at a possible destination for his investments? There are a couple things that a prudent foreign investor would look for. One, a government that is democratic mm -hmm. and that considers itself accountable, transparent, and governed by the rule of law. Definitely. All right? Yes. 
you look at the society, is there stability there? Political stability, legal stability, social stability. You look at the judicial and legal system. Is the laws in that country modern? Are they civilized? Would they protect my investments? Can I get protection for whatever I'm going to do? Would the government respect private property? Would it respect the Constitution? Would it respect contracts mm -hmm. that it enters, in, enters into? Exactly. Or is it a government that will wake up one day, sign a contract, uh, sorry, sign a contract, and then wake up the next day and disavow the contract, mm -hmm. disregards the contract, violates the contract, because there is some change of circumstances or for some capricious, arbitrary, and reasons not recognized by the law. Those are the things that a government, that an investor looks for. Yeah. Guyana today, and you would know this, and everybody listening would know, is one of the most sought after investments, destinations in this Western Hemisphere. You're seeing investors here from all parts of the globes, globe, mm -hmm. from the Far East, North America, South America, the Caribbean, Europe, you call it, they are prepared to come to Guyana. Right now we have about 10 five-star branded hotels, all under construction. You think these investors who have hotels all over the world would have come to Guyana if they were not satisfied that there is stability, that there's a government that will honor the law and comply with its contractual obligations, that you have a legal system that they believe will protect their investments, that there is an infrastructure in place, hmm. legally and otherwise, that would ensure that their investments are protected. Those are the questions that would have been asked yeah. and asked and answered by those investors. And that is why they're here. But so, so let me get to the point itself now. now. Every day, you have people out there who enter in into contracts. And let's say they buy a property. And for whatever reason, there's some delay or whatever reason, the property price skyrocket. Of course, the purchaser who purchased would want the vendor to stick to the deal. Yeah. The vendor, on the other hand, would want more because his property price has gone up. Mm -hmm. Would it be right for the vendor to unilaterally raise the price of the property? Mm. Would that be fair to anyone? There is a person who every day criticizes this contract, mm. a news outfit. He rents some land from the government. He pays a peppercorn rent. If, having regard to the changes taking place in the economy, right. the, value, the value of that property has gone up a million times, mm. but his rent remains the same. Remains the same. Mm. Because he signed a contract. And he signed a contract, right. and the government can't change it. Okay, so Imagine so, tomorrow yeah. the government is to now breach that contract yeah. and raise that rent, proportionate so the, raise it, the way it's supposed to have been raised, having regard to the escalation in value. What he would have said, right. but he is championing a cause every day to change this contract. Right. But listen to what the contract itself says. Okay. And that's what I want to come to. Okay. The contract says this. You see, many, many people who are writing about this contract and they are speaking about they have the, not contract. Seen the contract. They have never read it. Okay. They have never read is it. Is it and in the public domain? And it is in the public domain. We okay. made it public when we were in the opposition. Right. Except 
as may be expressly provided herein, mm -hmm. express ex except as provided in the contract, the government shall not amend, modify, rescind, terminate, declare invalid or unenforceable, require renegotiation of, compel replacement or substitution, or otherwise seek to avoid, alter, or limit this agreement without the written prior consent of the contractor. You want me to read it again? No, 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 I, I got it. I got it. Right? So in perpetuity, there's no date of expiry on this? No, the contract has an expiry date. Okay, okay. Right? Yeah. But once it is there and exists... What's the expiry date on the contract? I, I can't remember. I don't have the, I don't have the um, hmm. thing here. But once it is signed and executed and it remains extant, valid, and binding, this is what it says. Yes, yes. Now, we didn't sign this. Right. Well, you're bound by it. But we are bound by it. You see, it says expressly you cannot renegotiate mm. except with the prior consent of the, of the other side. Yeah. Now, the other side, as I said, is an investor. They got a deal. A very good deal. A good deal. I have described the contract myself mm. as one of the most lopsided contracts I've ever seen. Mm. It doesn't stop there. The contract continues, another component of it. It says that the government can't pass any law, mm -hmm. can't enter into any other contract, and can't do anything that would affect the current obligations wow. of the contractor. So which... which yeah, so I'm not finished. Mm -hmm. And if the government passes a law, that changes the obligations that currently exist on the, the, the operator, then the government has to compensate the operator for the change in circumstances. Wow. That is what they signed to. Right. Now, there are ways and means by which you can come out of a contract. Yes. No contract is crafted in stone. Yes. One is jurez. One is fraud, one is illegality, one is undue influence, and the type of factors like that. None of which operated at the time when this contract was signed. Right. You understand? Yeah, there was no duress, there was no... Precisely. Yeah. So, it is unfair. We are saying that it is unfair. But if not only will we, will we be breaching the contract, and if Exxon sues us, and they think mm. those who are championing the cause to breach the contract, they're talking about liability, then you will understand what liability is. So the allegation. If they decide to. So the to, allegation to, that the PVPC is in bed with ExxonMobil is not true, but. The opposite is true, that APNU FC, when they signed this contract, they were apparently in bed very comfortable with, with ExxonMobil. Well, you, on the public record, the minister who signed this contract was taken to Texas and spent a long time there. There are all sorts of allegations about monies being in bank account. A wedding was done somewhere in the Caribbean where planes were chartered from Guyana. And it is believed um, there are allegations about where that um, wedding funding would have come from. They were all contemporaneous with the signing of this contract. But I want to make another point. But if, the, if, the, if there's proof that ExxonMobil took advantage of an inexperienced government in power, these guys didn't know what they were doing, they didn't know what quantity of oil existed, the billions that will be you know, procured out of, out of selling this oil. ExxonMobil really, really is, is at fault in, 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 in some ways uh, well, in respect of putting a contract like that. before. That's exploitative, wouldn't you say? ExxonMobil has a reputation. Hmm. I, am, I will never defend ExxonMobil. Read about ExxonMobil international reputation. Yeah. 
That is what they do. But this that what is what aggressive companies do. Yeah. But it doesn't make it illegal. So let me get to the illegality now. Okay. The same bunch of people who are calling for saying that the contract is illegal, etc. They went to the court. And I sat back. I was named as a party, but I decided not to take a very active role. Mm -hmm. I sat back and I looked at what their arguments were. The arguments, none of them made sense. They were weak, tenuous, vexatious, and they were all dismissed. Mm. They, after the judge ruled, in a written ruling in the High Court, after examining it, I believe their lawyers advised them not to even appeal it. Mm -hmm. So it's not that the courts have not visited the contract. Forget my opinion. Yeah. They challenged the legality of the contract on a whole set of grounds. That it conflicted with the Constitution, that the license and, and the contract conflicted with the laws, that uh, the, the regime of tax concessions that they got were in violation of the taxing statutes, etc. All of that. Mm -hmm. And all of that were copiously and forensically examined by a judge and rejected. We have said, and I'm going to deal with the, what we have done to show our arm's length relationship. Right. I better do that before I get on to the other point that I want to make. Yeah. So, when we got into government... Because there's, there's this allegation that no, so the I'm going to, is in cahoots... I am going to show you the changes that we have made. Okay. So, we first have to understand that we were dealt with this card. We got to pay, play the game with this card. This contract mm -hmm. has constricted us within its four corners. Right. The licenses that have to be issued under these contracts are also so constricted mm -hmm. because the terms of the license got to be consistent with the terms of the contract. The minister who grants the license has a window of opportunity because he can grant it on such terms and conditions as he sees fit. While the discretion, ex facie or on its face, appears wide and unfettered, it is confined mm -hmm. by the four corners of this contract from which the license flows. All right? Mm -hmm. When they left government, they had two licenses in operation, Lisa 1 and Lisa 2. They had no financial assurance on those licenses, none. You see all this unlimited guarantee that they're clamoring for? Mm. AP and U AFC allow that operation to take place out there without a dollar assurance. Wow. Right? No financial assurance. We change that. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to get to that. Then they granted an environmental permit for 20 years to that company when the law permits only five. 20 years. 20 years. So that company, you, the e Environmental Protection Agency would never have had mm -hmm. an opportunity to review that operation. Remember you're starting small right, right, right. and then you get big. You expand. You're moving from one well to another. You move from X number of barrel to per day to X hundred barrel per day. Over a million now. Couple. So your environmental liability and the potential of environmental hazards, etc., are multiplying with alarming rapidity. Mm -hmm. Yet, they give them a 20-year contract permit. That means that the Environmental Protection Agency can't go in, can reassess, so that to put in more conditions, to assess the, 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 the operations, to say, look, your operations now have increased 40-fold. Oh. New conditions now will have to be negotiated. And this is part of the contract as well? 
Is this part of this contract? Yeah, they have to get an environmental permit under the right. contract. Right. Right? But the law limits that permit to five years. Why? Because it allows the agency to monitor. You can't get operate the same license when you're doing a hundred barrel a day. Mm. And the same environmental license you got when you got a, a thousand, ten thousand, we can't renew we can't we don't have a right of renewal, so we don't have any penalty outside of the license. Mm -hmm. Right? So that was what they did. Right. We adjusted it to five years in accordance with the act. Now, if we were in bed with ExxonMobil, would that be something that we would have done? Right. We're not finished. Mm. The first license that we granted, I believe, was Payara. Payara. Right? When you look at the Payara license and every other license after that, Arau, yellow tail, whip tail, and you compare it with the Lisa license that they granted, you are looking at two radically different documents. As constricted and confined as we are, we still managed to eke out variables and variations to include more conditions. Mm -hmm. So the financial assurance, for example, they never had it in place. We put it in place. We put it in the contract. But by the time we get to the stage of negotiation, negotiating what the sum would be, we put it in the environmental permit, sorry, and in the license. But be, by the time we get to negotiate what the sum were, or is going to be, the court proceedings was filed. Hmm. And we said that the Environmental Protection Agency said that, you know, that we are in the process with the government and the operator to find a position what the sum is going to be. The Environmental Protection Act tells you a couple of things. It says that the financial assurance got to be to the satisfaction of the state. So the government has a role to play. Mm -hmm. It also tells you that it must state an amount, mm -hmm. right? It gives you various forms by which this assurance can manifest itself. Mm. It can be cash. And of course, it must state the amount of the cash. How can you have limited, limitless cash? Right. Limitless cash. How can you have that? Right. That guarantee can be, it can be done by cash, mm -hmm. obviously, and, and, and the, the law says it. State the amount of cash. It can be done by letter of credit. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the letter of credit must state the amount. The law says it expressly. It can be done by a bond, insurance bond, a bank bond. Which insurance company will insure a risk that is limitless? No. Because the, bond say, the, 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 the law again says the bond must state the amount. Mm -hmm. How can you go to an insurance company and say insure a risk that is don't have any value, don't have any limit to its value? So, so, so the allegation that there is no environmental protection in the event that there is a spill in the and that is not true. It's a lie. So you have six hundred million U.S. dollar of insurance that Exxon has here, mm -hmm. and then you have the parent guarantee that the court fixed. One court says it must be unlimited. And that's why we appealed, mm -hmm. because that is a, an animal that is unknown to the law, yeah, yeah. is unknown to the commercial environment. So that is fixed now by the court at $2 billion. Although I think that the court should not fix it. It should be fixed by the Environmental Protection Agency, the government, and the company. Next like, that's not a matter for the judiciary. That's a matter for the executive oh. and the regulatory agency. But that's a different matter. Now, when, you, when we intervene in the case, to, to be heard, one, we are told that we are in bed with, the, with, 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 with Exxon. Simply because we are saying that if you impose an obligation on the licensee that is so onerous, mm -hmm. well, not onerous, it's impossible then you're going to shut down the sector. Now, the government's developmental agenda the, is tied to that sector. All the transformation that you're seeing taking place are tied to that sector. The, the, the growth in the economy, 
mm. is intricately tied to that sector. The foreign investors that are coming here by the droves are tied to that sector. So how can the government be kept out mm -hmm. or kept silent in the face of a potential closure of that sector? Right. So let me continue to deal with the other things that we have put in the license. Flaring. Right. There was no regulation of flaring under the previous license granted by AP and UAFC. We have made flaring an offense. And, well, not an offense, but we charge a fee for flaring mm -hmm. and using the acceptable standard. Right. So that is a mechanism in place. We also have uh, um, online data sharing. We insisted that they put a cable running from the operations a hundred and how many miles out. Mm -hmm. And there's a direct feed to the Environmental Protection Agency and to the Ministry of Natural Resources, mm -hmm. where we are observing real time what is going on outside there. That was never there. What is being extracted? What is being extracted? Mm. I hear some commentators are saying a ship could put a ship could come and take away thousands of barrels, and we don't know. Right. These guys, the amount of ignorance, uh. for want of a better word, that permeates. These things are being streamed live. We put that in place. You know how much that cost the company? Just to run a line. Right? How many miles? I think it's about 100, over 100 miles, 120 miles. Interesting. We also put in place uh, a mechanism that we, well, we, we didn't put it in place. We ensured that the company, at great expense, uh -huh. have the cap capability in Diana. To, to cap a well, there's a technical term for it, it's called capping stack or something like right. that. To cap a well if there is a problem out there, to, to, to avoid an a, a oil spill. Right. It, that didn't exist under Lisa 1 or 2. It's now there. And we, it was there firstly, but out of country presence. Right. It was somewhere in the Gulf of Mexico or somewhere there. Now there's an in country presence of that capability, right? Oh, we good. have a mechanism also that allows us to monitor the oil in the reserve, mm -hmm. in the reservoir, sorry, the amount that is discovered, etc. We All of that are capabilities mm -hmm. that we have ensured were put into place. Mm -hmm. Why? These were not there before. Right. This oil sector operated for nearly four years under the previous administration with none of these things. And then we didn't leave it there. We did a whole series of things, if you permit me to talk about them. Well, yeah, I mean, I, mean, I don't want to get too in involved in, you know, so there's a lot of things. I mean, that, that's, that list is pretty impressive that you said. But I want to ask you about environment and, and just kind of like put this out there. We are producing this oil, but it's, Guyana is not using the oil. The oil has been shipped to the international market, uh, supply and demand. We don't have that demand for that oil. Um, President uh, Irfan Ali and uh, yourself, uh, Vice President Jack Dio, have you know sort of talked about net zero and, mm -hmm. and, and the trading of this oil offsetting by our forest. We have one of the Oh, few countries in the world, very few, a handful of countries, we have an abundance of forestry where we can trade our, you know, pr production of CO2 uh, gas emission to offset it with, mm -hmm. with, with, with our forest. So the question is, uh, the allegation is that you're trading our, you, you know, you, we, we are producing all these, you know, gas, oil and gas, and we're using our forest, which is, belongs to the people of Guyana, as to balance the books, so to say. And I wanted to sort of ask you about that, like, put that out there, sort of, in the, in, environmentalists are putting this but, as a question. The president did a program with a BBC reporter. Talk. And I believe he addressed the problem 
comprehensively the issue. The truth of the matter is, why should we not exploit our God-given resources for the benefit of our people? The Americans have done it. You lived in Canada for how many years? They have done it. They have oil rigs all over. Alaska has oil rigs all over. Saudi Arabia is doing it. Trinidad did it right here for 100 years. Venezuela did it here for 150 years. We have the tarpons in Alberta. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Why must Guyana be denied and deprived of the opportunity of using what God has given us for our benefit when the entire world is doing it? Mm -hmm. Since when Guyana now is the environmental police and we must be the environmental barometer by which international standards are measured. We are a poor country. With all the oil that are out there, we are still one of the poorest countries on, in the world. And you are going to pick on us? Uh -huh. You have graded down your forests. You have exploited all your oil. You have put nuclear waste into the system. Yeah. You have polluted the environment exponentially, and you still continue to do so. And then you want tiny little Guyana now getting to feed its people, now building proper highways, now being able to send its children to school oh. from university, from, from primary to, uh, to a universal level, from nursery to, oh. to university, now being able to afford health care that you have a hundred years ago because of what you have done, and rightfully so, uh -huh. because you want your people to live uh -huh. a quality life. But we in Guyana, what, we are inferior? We are not, in, oh, I don't know if we are, is it that we are a different species? Right. So that's how I will answer that. Yeah. There's, a, there, there's a demand internationally for oil. We're not the ones who are creating this demand. And, and we, have, we have said, and we have demonstrably shown that all international standards are being complied with. We have observed all the international um, protocols regarding our forests. In fact, we are selling carbon credit mm -hmm. to the rest of the world. Exactly, yeah. So we are a model nation in that regard. Right. Want, so, oh, before you finish, because we have a limited amount of time, I wanted to ask you about our depletion policy, the government's depletion policy. Do we have a program in place where we take monies that we're earning now, put it aside for future generations to benefit from when oil and gas might be over. So, that takes me to the, 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 the uh, Natural Resource Fund, hmm. right? Okay. Now, you look around the world and you see countries have taken decades before they established a na Natural Resource Fund of the type that we have. Trinidad pump oil and produce oil for nearly 80 years before they did so. Norway, which is regarded as a model, I believe they took 40 years before they set up a natural resource fund of the type that you're referring to, uh -huh. to care for future generations. We have done it in our government. After one year, we were in government. One year, within one year, we set up a natural resource fund. Reviewed the model that we used, we re it was reviewed by international agencies, the IMF, the World Bank, and lauded. We scrapped the existing one that they had, the AP and UEFC government had. You know what they did? After they were defeated by a no confidence motion, after they were defeated by a no confidence motion, they went one day in the parliament without the public's knowledge, without the opposition's knowledge, and they passed a the law. Now a law is passed in three stages. You have to have the first reading, then you adjourn, and you do the second and third reading. And you have to have a seven days um, distance between the two, the mm. first and the second day reading. That's the, the laws, the rules under the standing order. Mm. In complete violation of that, they read the entire bill. After the last government convened a parliament that would have been dissolved by law. Because mm -hmm. after the government is de defeated, defeated no confidence, yeah. the parliament is automatically dissolved because the next stage is election. Mm -hmm. They went in the parliament and they passed that law. We scrapped that. We put this in place now and it has every dollar that comes into that fund in an account, a designated account, 
goes into the consul fund in accordance with that act and can only come out of the consul fund in a manner described by the act, which is to go to the parliament. It can only be spent on projects listed in the act, right? Mm -hmm. So you can't, the president can't decide to buy an helicopter tomorrow mm -hmm. for his personal movement around the country. It doesn't uh, permit that. Then you have layers and layers of scrutiny. If monies are deposited there and the Minister of Finance does not make the deposit public, he has a 10-year jail term. Oh. Right? Okay. You have two layers of scrutiny by two different bodies in the law. And these are comprising of persons who are independent, not politicians, not ministers. You have, I believe, an opposition representative there too. Right? Then the Auditor General. So you have parliamentary scrutiny as well. Mm -hmm. Then you have the Auditor General audits the funds. And if he can't afford or he doesn't have the capacity to audit, he has the authority to hire whoever, mm. Deloitte and Touche, Price, Pricewaterhouse, any international company, to come and, and, and help. So there is adequate safeguard for that. Mm. We also did a new act, a new law, as we promised, because, first of all, our laws were archaic. It never contemplated and was not drawn up in a manner to regulate an environment that was producing. It was an exploratory type of law. We consulted wide and far, internationally and locally. Public consultations locally mm -hmm. and crafted a new, completely new petroleum activities bill, which is now law. Mm -hmm. That bill is modern, captures all the environmental concepts, and creates a strong regulatory framework, even after production. How do you seal off the well? How, what, how do you ensure that there is no, you know, all those things are covered. Mm -hmm. Then we did a draft, new PSE. Okay. Not this one, a new PSE. We consulted again, publicly on it. it. The new PSA drastically changes the terms and conditions that we will now enter into in relation to new contracts going forward. Right. But did it apply to Whiptail? No. Whiptail is from under this contract. Okay. It's from that same block. That's and that's what, we keep, that's what we keep saying all the time. Mm. This PSA con covers that block. The new blocks now, the new PSA will cover. Hmm. As I said, we sent out the law, we sent out the new PSA, and we didn't get any outcry, no criticism. Even those who are criticizing now, I believe, hmm. by their silence, I assume that they accepted it. And we made some fundamental changes. Royalty would have moved from 2%, for example, to 10%. Right? So that's a significant, so that's 10% of gross. Right. Then we move the um, cost oil, okay. the cost recovery mechanism. Right now it is a 75%. Mm -hmm. We have dropped it now to 65%. Okay. So annually, they got to only, only take 65% of cost and then 30%, 35% is what will be shared 50-50. Um, right. right now it is 25%. And you, we're getting a 10% royalty on the top of it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So these are significant, these are significant variations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, if we are in bed with oil companies, would, would, would our government be doing these things? Absolutely. And you know what is, the, what is a telling thing that sometimes people don't realize? Mm -hmm. you, you get the impression from these persons who are critical of the sector that there is so much oil here and, 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 you know, you could just chase out these people and uh, take over the assets. The truth of the matter is that you have many operators out there, you know. Mm -hmm. It's only one that has struck gold. Wow. Only one. Wow. We went out to public bids for the 14 remaining oil blocks. Mm -hmm. Public bids. Only two 
international companies expressed an interest, mm -hmm. sent in a bid. The four others are local companies. They can't yeah. operate, I mean, yeah. with the greatest of respect. Yeah. Only serious, so really two serious bids. Right. So when, you, when, you, when they say that we have this huge amount of interest out there, mm -hmm. it's, it's not necessarily so. Attorney General, it has been a fascinating afternoon, really incredible conversation. I thank you so much on behalf of DPI and NCN. Thank you for joining me this afternoon. I thank you for offering me the opportunity and I hope that I have given, done justice to your, Absolutely. To your theme yeah. of dispelling the misinformation which surround, unfortunately surround the oil and gas sector. Thank you. Thank you, thank you sir.